I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for InstitutionalAdvisors.com. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, Jim, good to be with you and also to be good to be with our listeners. Some suspicious unemployment numbers from the U.S., they say they added 255,000 jobs last month, whereas in Canada, we lost over 31,000 jobs. Yeah, well, you know, the BLS, Bureau of Labor, what a statistics does the numbers in the U.S., and I think they should obviously take over and start doing the Canadian numbers. Uh, the whole thing is very suspect. They have uh, any number of descriptions of employment or unemployment. And the main thing is, I think it's around 94 million people have left the, or have given up trying to find a job. So then they don't count. So if they were included, maybe you'd have a, an unemployment figure at 15%. You know, don't quote me on that one. So see, these are just illustrative. Instead, they're down in the 5%. Uh, it, it is, it's pathetic that these guys are allowed to continue to spin numbers like this without serious criticism. But, yeah, there is. You see some of the sites, there are guys doing serious criticism of it, but everybody wants to believe, and uh, it's sad. But at any rate, it it, it moved the markets. It was uh, very good for the, like, the Dow's up 160 now. And what we were looking at in the chart pattern here is one more thrust up uh, soon. And this could be a, a completing move for the rally that began out of the disaster back in January. And uh, with this is also, uh, as I said, moved up the dollar strongly. So this has uh, got people buying uh, the standard type stocks, uh, as we call it, the the Nifty 500. Uh, the uh, if if I was a central bank. You're not going to go fooling around with the smaller cap stocks. So they've been buying, essentially, I guess, the S&P 500. And the term Nifty 50, or the Nifty 500, is based on a popular set of stocks in the late 60s, early 70s, which the institutions loved. And it was called the Nifty 50. And that thing was defying defined gravity for a long time until we got to January 1973 and then you had the worst uh, bear market since the uh, 1930s. So here you now have this and the other day it came out and it was announced that uh, the Swiss National Bank, which is their uh, central bank, had been aggressively buying stocks in the first half of the year, uh, U.S. stocks. So they, this is a, I, I take it as a an admission of failure because the basic theory, as we keep hammering about, is that if the central bank injects credit, that that then pushes business activity and everything's happy. But uh, as we've seen over the last number of decades, the public chooses what it's going to speculate late in, and if the credit's not being used in in industry and in commerce, then it flows into somewhere else, and and it was into the, well, into the stock market now, senior stocks. And until a year or so ago, it was into junk bonds, and and until this last year, it was into high-end real estate in London, Hong Kong, and Toronto, Vancouver, and Manhattan. Uh, these are, well, Vancouver may be stalling out, but we know that Manhattan and London stalled out already, so it's it's right out of control of 
central bankers' hands, and they must be getting frustrated. So then what they've done now is gone direct to buying stocks, uh, thinking that the wealth effect will then uh, do the business activity that they've been hoping for. But, you know, it's it's bizarre out there, Jim. A, a certain side of government is, keeps coming in with more rules and regulation, supposedly on the theory that it improves things. But it hampers business activity, rules and regulations. So then you got another set of economists at the central banks who look at the weak growth and say, oh, this is uh, not up to potential, and all it needs is some credit to make it up to potential. But with the lid on economic activity, as I said, the credit goes into uh, financial asset games. And uh, these then become uh, overbought and eligible for correction. So this is what seems to be happening now with the S&P and Dow. But in looking at things here on, you remember the old Dow theory that we were going on about last year? We'd never used it before, but it was became intriguing in the first part of the year that the highs being set by the Dow were not being confirmed by new highs for the transport index. And then by May, this became acute where the uh, the transports did fail. And then that said that the bull market was over. So, of course, with expecting rallies out of the January disaster, uh, who knows whether it would then, whether you'd go to new highs. But uh, this is where we are for a certain set of stocks. But if you take a look at the NYSE Composite Index, uh uh-uh, not new highs, but more specifically, if we look at the at the transport, uh, definitely not new highs. Uh, so it it was the alert a year ago in May, and it is the alert now that the whole stock market is not as as bold as the senior indexes. So. This could culminate, I don't know, maybe a few weeks' time here, and it could be supported by a nice recovery in crude oil. It's not so much there today because of the sudden jump in the dollar index, but uh, crude uh, sold off from 51 on the big rally out of uh, the disaster in January and right down to, oh, I think it was 39 and became oversold last week, and uh, we've been looking for a rally in crude. But, of course, with the exceptional news and uh, the move in the dollar index, crude's back a bit. And uh, So crude and some other commodities could be okay through August. We were thinking that the stock market would be okay through August, and this zest now in the stock market is really very good for setting up a culmination move. So that, that's good, too. And then uh, then there's the uh, the gold sector, and it today really doesn't like the strong move in the dollar index. So you've got gold and silver down. But uh, the sector has been absolutely fabulous since uh, the first of the year. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after the break. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. The latest stats show Canada's trade deficit is at a record high. I thought the idea of having a low dollar was to improve our international trade. Oh, that's another intuitive, bogus theory uh, spun up by uh, interventionist economists. You know, these guys are pathetic. Uh, and, and the economy is always changing. Foreign exchange rates are always changing, and but you've always got these guys with their special theories. And 
And the unfortunate thing is when you come to economists and theories, they really need a government in order to implement their very personal theories. And it's it's absolutely absurd. If, if, if more of the public understood it, it, it wouldn't be allowed. Uh, you can't prevent somebody from being delusional, but what you can do is prevent them from imposing their delusions upon society through the financial markets. And you know, this business that uh, you can depreciate the, the, say, for example, the, the Canadian dollar, and you're going to get a certain amount of growth out of it. I mean, it, it's, there's too many variables on it. And, you know, you've got some in the States now are beginning to criticize the NAFTA agreement between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And I am and always have been for free trade. But the NAFTA was a negotiated, agreed-upon set of rules and regulations sort of dealing with free trade and did open up things and help Mexicans. But if one wants free trade, you just unilaterally declare free trade with every country in every direction. But the other problem with the NAFTA, other than being a negotiated trading system, is that they allowed the cheat of currency depreciation, either by the Mexicans or by Canada. And that is highly offensive if you're sitting there in the United States. So if you want real free trade, you open up free trade and you have a sound currency, i.e. convertible into gold so that nobody can cheat on it, and then let it all sort itself out. But this these business with NAFTA as a bureaucratic trade mechanism and the one, new one they're working on with Asia, TPP or whatever it is, and then the existing nightmare in Europe uh and the Brits were very wise to leave, and it, it'll be a lot of work to leave. But I think we're at the start of a, a major change away from bureaucratic intervention and towards uh, more freedom-like decisions and stuff like that. And then this, this of course, could become rather acute because uh, it's well advertised the amount of money that's been expended in all their quantitative easing schemes. And uh, since the crash of 08, actually, they opened up the taps way before that. Uh, in 2007, at the first sign of trouble, which was with Bear Stearns, they opened up the taps and they had lots of money, but it crashed anyways. But it So this whole business has now driven interest rates in some countries, and for a lot of debt to minus in nominal terms, which is really absurd, um, it's going to fail at some point because it has incited speculation around the world. And, uh, for example, uh, oh, last month we got the move in the long-dated treasuries bonds got hyper-excited and gave a rare upside exhaustion and other technical stuff. So we were taking that as potentially the a, a major top in, in the U.S. bond market. Now, in the bond markets in Europe, they're much smaller. In the, like with the European Central Bank buying uh, corporate bonds, the amount of buying they can do and the amount of bonds outstanding there, there's not enough bonds. So... But you've got one big player in a small market. In treasury market in the U.S., it's, a, it's the biggest market, and there are many players in it outside of the central banks. So it's all the many players out there that can overwhelm the ambition of central banks. And so this is where you have a technical, a very important high set uh, last month. And we're going to watch this thing for it to break down. And once it does really break down, this could get serious because one of the features of a post-bubble contraction is that real 
interest rates go up, that by real, it's the rate, rate of nominal, the, the, the coupon you see, uh, less the rate of inflation. And that, again, is outside of the influence of the central bankers. So uh, this, I think, is going to overwhelm. The other thing that we know from history is that the while a central bank may be able, may be able to shift interest rate structures down in yield, they have no control of the credit uh, of the yield curve, which is the difference between long dated and short dated instruments. And when it turns, and it it is turning now to in a, towards negative, it's been constructive for most of the year, but it's starting to turn to uh, a, a warning. And the uh, the Federal Reserve has absolutely no control. Over the yield curve, when it wants to turn, it turns. And then the other one is the credit spreads, which is the difference between high-grade bonds and low-grade bonds. And it's still, well, it's been a party since the disaster in January, where the uh, spreads widened right out to 20%, and now it's in the 13%, which is a huge move. It's been a very resolute move. And for the last two weeks, it's been uh, relatively unchanged. Just sort of looks like it's trying to bottom. Now, this is, as I want to emphasize this one, is that when credit spreads are ready to change, they'll change, and, and the Fed has nothing to do with it, can't do anything about it. And so the U.S. credit market, which is the biggest in the world, is still going to be dominated by players who are outside of the Federal Reserve System. And you can have a bear market in long-dated treasuries. You can have the curve steepening further. And then eventually, maybe two or three weeks from now, the credit spreads will start to widen. And then you'll get a, another contraction. And at that point, I hope the public brings in its common sense and says, look it, you've spent and risked huge amounts of tax money defending your theory and it ain't working so the public will move to uh, uh to uh bring in some discipline to the central banks which is going to be fascinating maybe this might be uh, uh appearing towards the end of September early October it'll we'll have some something ex- really exciting to talk about then bob thank you so much for chatting with us hey jim good to be with you My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for Institutional Advisors. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is TalkDigitalNetwork. Questions for the show or for Bob can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.